You know, usually when we plant, when we start our sermon collections, we like to plan them months in advance because we want to give people the time to, or we want to give our team the time to come up with digital assets and deliverables that we really need in order to uh, make sure that the service goes off with a hitch. And given the um, interest in October over spiritual things because of Halloween, I was going to talk about spiritual warfare. And we were going to preach a, str- a series on strongholds and the demonic oppression and the unseen realm. Um, but as we begin to pray in September and pray throughout the rest of the, or early this month, I realized that it's time for us to make a shift as Accelerate Church. That it's time for us to make a shift. And one of the big things we have to do is we have to begin to believe in God to do the extraordinary. And it's time for us to have the type of faith that Jesus says when you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And so today I want to start a new series called Unlimited, where there's a variety of reasons why we have limited faith. I want to talk about those in a second. But I want to help us move in this next season so that we can be a church that has unlimited faith, that believes in God that he can do the supernatural, that believes in a God that is able to do exceeding and abundant or more than we can ask or think. Now, I want to avoid sensationalized language. We use that sometimes, like, this is going to be the best sermon collection you've ever heard in your life. I often don't say that because that may not be true, but I really do believe that this series is going to help inspire your faith. And I believe it's going to help that those folks whose faith has died the last few years because you haven't been seeing the change that you've been expecting God to see, that I believe this is going to stir you up and you're going to take some next steps in your faith journey. And when you do, you'll be able to identify and pinpoint this time or this collection as the time in which you began those next steps. And so today I want to preach from the subject unlimited faith, unlimited faith. Let's start with considering this idea. There are two times in the New Testament where Jesus was amazed, two times in which Jesus was astounded. The first time happened in Mark, the sixth chapter, verses five and six. When Jesus comes to his hometown, how many of you know when you come to your hometown, they talk bad about you sometime? Like, you bringing up old stories, that's not even who I am anymore. You still calling me my nickname from when I was a little boy? Aren't there some other stories to be told about me? But he comes to his hometown and they're like, yo, who is this dude? Coming in here? Acting like he's got power and authority. Isn't that Mary's son? Isn't that Joseph's stepson? Isn't this person named Jesus who's the carpenter? And the verse says that Jesus could not do any miracles in that town except lay the hands on a few sick because of this, because of their lack of faith. And then there's another time in Luke, the ninth chapter, verse 7 where there's a Roman centurion who happens to be a Roman soldier during that time who was known for being cruel to Jewish people, but he had ethics and morals, and one of his servants was sick. So they came up to Jesus, and he said, hey, can you come heal my servant? And Jesus says, yeah, sure, I'll come with you to your house. And he said, oh, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. I am a man under authority. I'm a boss. When I tell people to go, they go. When I tell them to come, they come. What I need you to do, Jesus, is just speak the word. Because if you have said it, I know that it's going, to ha- be, it's going to happen. And so Jesus turns around, looks to the crowd, and says, I am amazed because I've never found faith like this anywhere in Israel. And with those two stories in mind, let, let's consider this idea. These are two different stories and two different portions of the Bible and two different times that Jesus was amazed. One time he is amazed because of their limited faith. The other time, he's amazed because of their unlimited faith. So here's the question that I want to pose today. If Jesus looked at your faith today, would he be impressed by your bold prayers? Would he be impressed by you believing in faith and his supernatural ability? Would he be impressed by your big plans and your ambitious goals? Or would he be astounded because you struggle to believe? Or would he be taken back because of your lackluster thinking? Would would he be taken back because even though you're young, you're walking into your golden years systematically? And would he be taken back by your ability to squeeze all the juice out of the orange of life 
Or would he say, you've played it safe? You've been risk averse. Would Jesus be astounded by your limited faith? Or would he be perplexed by your unlimited faith? And so today, friends, whether your faith is magnificent or whether your faith is magne- uh, uh, blah, 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 magnificent or whether it's meager, I want to give you some content today to help stir up your faith and to rekindle your fire and to rekindle your belief in God's ability to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. Maybe you're here and you're a skeptic today. You're in the process of deconstructing. You grew up in church or you went to Catholic school and you were taught all these things. And you're like, nah, I I don't know if I have faith. Let me just be honest with you. All of us have faith in something because faith has an object. Maybe it's scientism. Maybe you believe in rational principles. Maybe you're, uh, you're an evolutionary biologist and you believe the world was created through a big bang. I would say the big bang is an act of faith and then everything else is naturalism. But, but nevertheless, you've built your life on a specific thing. Maybe it's scientism. Maybe it's atheism, right? All of us have faith because when you sat in those seats, I don't see anyone checking the structural integrity of the seat. You just believed that it was going to get you there. You didn't do the walk around your car to make sure no oil was leaking and all that type of stuff. No, you put your car, you put your key in the ignition and turned it on. Why? Because you had faith that when you turned the ignition that it was going to come on. So each of us has faith in something The question is, is what have you placed your faith in? Have you placed your faith? Because, like I said, faith has to have an object. Faith has to believe that something or someone is able to do something. Let me me go on. I'll tell you about that in a second. So here's the big idea I have for you. Here's the big idea. Unlimited faith leads to extraordinary outcomes. Unlimited faith leads to extraordinary outcomes. Now, There are several things that hinder our faith, several ones. Um, There's several things that hinder us from having the type of faith to which we aspire to have. And so here's the first point. Here, let let me break them down for you. Number one, faith is often limited by our faculties. Faith is often limited by our faculties. Let me tell you the first thing. I'm going to give you three things, three things that limit our faith. Here's the first one. The first one is our comfort zone our comfort zone. Many of us love our comfort. We love our comfortable pillows. We love our comfortable sheets. We love our comfort food and a variety of other things. Now, the comfort zone has its perk, right? Because your mind is at ease in the comfort zone because it's, it keeps your mind at ease and it shields you from potential risk. But here's the problem is that many of us already know the outcomes of the comfort zone in most situations. When you're in the comfort zone, there are relatively no surprises. There are no risks. There are no challenges. And when that happens, that means that there are little growth opportunities. So rather than us, pursue, rather than us pursuing in faith what God has told us to do, many of us are staying confined in the comfort zone because we believe it's safer and it's better for our lives than believing God to do the extraordinary. Faith, friends, is not blind faith. It's based upon the fact. It's based upon us believing and knowing and having facts about God. But it is you stepping out of your comfort zone into the hands of the one that can comfort you through every trial that you go through. Because here's the thing. The reason that some of us don't step out of our comfort zone is because we are addicted to control. We're addicted to it. We're addicted to control. We micromanage our families. We micromanage our finances. We micromanage the people in our life. We don't like when things get outside of the box. But let me just tell you, you cannot micromanage God and grow at the same time. God does not have to give you a detailed itinerary and a step-by-step navigation on everything in life. Because if he did, then it wouldn't require faith. It would require rationalism. And God is not opposed to rational thinking. He's not opposed to wisdom. But some things you do in life will require you to step out of the comfort zone of the known and walk into the destiny of what God has for you, come what may. 
The comfort zone is killing some of y'all. You think you're winning. You are not winning. You are hindering yourself from opportunities. You're hindering yourself from growing. You're hindering yourself from experiencing the bountiful abundance of God's grace because you want to stay in this little tight box. And God is like, I've got so much more for you. I've got so much more. I told you this story at launch one time, but, but, but there was one time when um, I was going to take my kids to the pool. And, and we were living in Camden at the time. And, you know, Camden has a little water table. So uh, when it rained one day and there was a big puddle outside. And I have them in their swimming stuff. And so the first thing they did was they ran out of the house and jumped in the pool. They jumped in the pool. On top of them getting dirt everywhere, I'm like, kids, we are going. They jumped in the puddle. We're going to the pool. You don't have to settle for the puddle. We're going to the pool. That's going to have, we're going to have so much fun in there. We're going to swim, and we're going to play with all the noodles and all that type of stuff. Don't settle for the puddle when you can have the pool. Here's what I'm saying. Some of you are settling today for the pool or the puddle of comfort, the puddle of what you know when God is like, I've got an Olympic-sized swimming pool of blessings and doors I want to open for you, but you would rather stay in the puddle, dirtying yourself and contaminating yourself and leaving out all of the opportunities that I have for you to grow. Look at your neighbor and tell them, get out of the puddle. So number one, number one, some of us are in the comfort zone too much. The second thing that's hindering us is our current situation. Our current situation. Let's be honest with you. It's hard to see God as a healer when you are taking multiple medications per day for your chronic disease. Oh, it's hard to see God as a healer when your back is hurting and when your sugar is out of whack and your mental health seems unstable. It's hard. It's hard when you've got more money than month or more month than money. There we go. You got more money, you got more month than money. It's, it's hard to see God as a provider when you don't know where your next meal is coming from during the day. It's hard to see God as a deliverable and, and someone that can deliver you from the tight spot when you're in a different when you're in a difficult situation. But I just want to tell you, friends, that's why in the Christian faith we say this that you have to live by faith and not by sight. Because, friends, hear, hear me, in simpler terms, if you believe that only what you can see is all there is to be seen, then you're missing out so much more on what God can do. How do I know? Hebrews 1, this is what it says. It says, now faith is the substance or confidence. I'm, that's King James. Now faith is the confidence of what was hoped for and the assurance of what is not seen. Um, not so long ago, I went to the eye doctor. I went to the eye doctor, and they said, well, Mr. Grant, because of the nature of your work, you're staring at the computer a lot, uh, you're becoming more and more nearsighted. And they said, Mr. Grant, you probably want to grab some glasses. I said, by the time I come in here next time, I will be healed in the name of Jesus. I will have 20-20 eyesight, and you will see it. I declare it right now in Jesus' name. Came back a few months later. Condition had worsened. <laughs> it's gotten, gotten worse but here's the thing eyesight is valuable is it not it's valuable we're, we're grateful we're able to see but here's the thing eyesight is valuable but it's also very limited because even though it's great your eyesight can hinder you from seeing what God wants to do in the supernatural so, so what does that have to do here's the definition now faith is the confidence it's this assured hope and things, and hope and assurance, and what we do not see. In other words, here it is, is trust in God to bring the intangible into the tangible realm. It's trust in God and belief in his ability, the same one that created the earth and spoke the world into the existence, the same one that took this invisible, immaterial world and made all of it like we see now, is his ability, is believing in his ability to bring about something physically that we can only see spiritually, right? So it's trust in God to give you something that you don't currently see with your natural senses, let, let me say it a little bit more, Cherry Hill Camden. It's believing that God wants to deliver a package when you don't have the tracking number. I, I know it's on the way. I know it's ordered, but I just don't see the evidence of it yet. But if I'm just patient and I just wait, 
and I just trust God and his ability to do things, he can take something that's immaterial and something that is not seen, and he can make it physical so that I see it in my hands. The next time I went to the doctor, they put this uh, phoropter over my eyes. It's that thing with all the lenses. And they put it over my eyes. They're like, how, can, how do you see, Mr. Graham? I'm like, oh, it's, it's clear. I can see all the things on the back of the wall, right? That's kind of like what faith is. Faith is God's lenses that he puts over your eyes so that you can see into the spiritual realm something that does not exist in the physical realm at present. It's believing that, God, you told me to start this business. You told me to, to do all this stuff. And even though I'm in debt right now and I'm struggling, I'm believing that you're going to bring about abundance. God, I've been fighting in my marriage for the last few years. I've been going back and forth with my spouse. I've been struggling so much, but I'm believing that my eyes are not going to negate what I know you're able to do physically. That, God, my money might not be where I need it to be right now, God. I don't have that job, but you're the one that told me to go get this master's. And you're the one that told me to go get this certification. And you're the one that told me to go in this field. And even though I don't see the fruit or the evidence yet, I'm going to trust you confidently that if I walk with you in faith, if I believe in your, in your ability, that, God, you will do what I can't see. That's what he enables us to do, friends. It's believing that even though I'm currently barren, that I'm going to have some babies. It means that even though I'm currently broke, that I'm going to have abundance. It's anticipating the things that I can't see becoming a reality. So what hinders us is our comfort zone. What hinders us is our, is our current predicament. But what also hinders a lot of us is our fear of failure. Oh, yeah, we have a fear of failure. Many of us are so paralyzed by fear that we don't try new things. We don't try new things. We barely go to different restaurants because we only like the same set thing. We're paralyzed by fear. But here's the thing. When you are paralyzed by fear, you avoid different opportunities. You avoid activities. You avoid tackling responsibilities. And let me just tell you, if you are shackled by fear, you will never become the free person that God intends for you to be. You will never be that. If you are just shackled by fear continually, you will never be the person that God wants you to be by faith. Can, can, can we just dismantle some of this fear stuff real quick? Can I give you some quick points on that, some sub points? Uh, number one, here's what I want you to know. Fear is universal. I'm sorry. Failure is universal. Failure is universal. Um, I, I love John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Ooh, I just love that. Cotton candy of the word, isn't it? Cotton candy. Ooh, I'm like, ooh, that's so sweet. We walk by faith. Ooh, that's so sweet. But you know what my favorite verse is in the Bible? You need to write this one down. James 3, 2. It says that we struggle, all of us struggle in a variety of ways. That means it, do, you don't, it doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter how many certifications or how little education you have. Each of us is going to fail and stumble at some point or another. We are all going to fail. It's a universal part of the experience. Here's the next one. Failure is not fatal. Failure is not fatal. You are not going to die by failing. You are not going to die. In, in fact, this is what the scripture says, Proverbs 24, 16. It says, a righteous man falls down seven times, but he always rises up again. And so right now, you might just be falling, like, let me just give you a hand. Get your behind up. Get up. Can I be your motivational speaker and your preacher? Get up. You've been down for five years now. You've been complaining about that thing for so long now. Okay, but if, if you believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, and if the Holy Spirit is able to empower you and get, help you be strengthened. I want to just tell you, get up right now. No, they didn't come through for you. No, they didn't show up. But you know who did show up for you? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They have showed up for you. I, like, like, I understand that you have to have seasons in which you mourn loss. And I understand that you have to have times in which you're like, God, I'm, I'm struggling in this season. But some of you have made that your identity. You have made failure your identity. You have made pain your identity. But I'm just saying, somebody just needs to know that God is trying to break you out of that because he used the failure. He used the hardship to shape you into the person that you are. It's universal. It's universal, friends. Let's redefine failure. Failure is not 
failing or doing something that didn't work. Failure is not doing it at all. It's not doing it at all. I respect people that fail because at least they went for it. They went for it. They tried. Shannon Sharp. Uncle Shay Shay. Unc, as we like to call him. The sole proprietor of Club Shay Shay. Sat was a Hall of Fame tight end that became a sports broadcaster. And he was on the show on FS1 called Undisputed across from his co-host Skip Bayless. And after a seven year run, they decided that they were gonna break apart. And so Shannon looked at his co-host in his Mississippi draw, and he says, hey, I want you to know this. When you lay your head on a pillow at night, I want you to know that I gave you my all. I I'm just saying what Shannon is saying it needs to be some of our testimony. That, that, that even though I didn't know how it was gonna work out on the other end, even though I didn't know what the results were going to be, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I can rest soundly knowing that I did my best, I worked my hardest, I had integrity, I did the right thing, and then what God did is he had the results on his own. I'm not worried about my results. Let me just tell you something. I know you want the results, and I know you want God to do something, but it still requires you getting up and fighting for it. You want to have a good marriage? You got to fight for it. You want to have great finances? You got to fight for it. You want to start a church and do some amazing things? You have to fight for it, friends. When you lay your head on a pillow at night, don't lay your head down with regret. Author Daniel Pink said that there's four core regrets that people have. One is moral regret. Well, I wish I had done the thing, right thing. Some is foundational regret. Oh, I wish that I had worked harder. But the other regret that I want to tell you is the boldness regret. I wish I had gone for it. I wish that I made that call. I wish that I pushed for it. I wish that I said that thing that I didn't say. What I'm saying is when you lay your head on that pillow at night, don't have boldness regret because don't have boldness regret. Have the type of regret that says, I went for it. It didn't work out. God is going to turn the chapter and open up another door for me. You got to have some of that Uncle Shannon Sharp type of faith. And can I just say something? That's a bit tangential. When I look out, I'm, I'm really encouraged by all of you, but I, I just want to let you know, some of you are playing it too safe. Oh, you're playing it too safe. God's been telling you to put out that application and look for that new job, but you like your department right now. He's been saying that I, I might want to elevate you and push you forward, but I can't because you're stuck in where you are. I've been pushing you to start that business, uh, and, but all you want to do is minimize uncertainty. You want to opt for no risk. You don't want any adverse outcomes, but all the beautiful things that have happened in your life happened because you were pushed up against a difficulty and God helped you overcome. Here's the thing. Some of us, the reason we don't step out of our comfort zone and the reason that we're hindered by our current situation is because we want too many guarantees. All we want to guarantee, we want to know that it's going to work out. And we want, to, we want somebody to prophetically declare in the spirit that it's going to work out. Well, let me do that for you. It may not work out. It may not. The people in Hebrews 11, some of them died still believing in faith. But even if it doesn't work out in this lifetime, God promises that it's going to work out eternally, that he's going to work it out for your good, that he's going to work it out for his glory. You just have to walk. Here's the second point. Oh, no, here's a sticky statement. You're going to write this down. To walk into your destiny, you must walk away from your security. I'm not saying sell the house and sell the floor, but some of you are overly looking for security. You got $10,000 in the bank telling people you broke. I don't like y'all. People I know that's broke, they like, well, I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that not to sell everything off, but to ask God, hey, God, where are the areas in my life where I'm seeking security so much that it's hindering me from having faith in you? Here, here's my second point. Here's my second point. Faith requires action. Faith requires action. In the words of Brian Loritz, faith requires you having shoe leather. In other words, if you believe in something, you have to walk in that direction. So, so the author of Hebrews, which is actually disputed in modern, in, the, in, in, in the academic culture, some people believe is Paul, 
Some believe it's Opolis, but I'm just going to say it's Paul for the sake of the argument because some of his language is that way. He begins in chapter, in chapter 11, verse 3, by talking about all of these different people who fought or who exhibited great faith during difficult challenges. Let me just highlight two. Let me highlight three, four. The first one was Abraham. Abraham was told in Genesis 22. He said, hey, I want you to take that son. You remember that son I blessed you with when you were 90 years old? When you were 100 years old, right, and your wife was 90? I want you to take that baby, and I want you to go to Mount Moriah, and I want you to take a knife, and I want you to slaughter your kid. Slaughter, that's what he wants him to do. Now, he ended up not doing that because he had faith in God to know that even if he did, he would raise him back up. But here's what he did. What he, here's what he was saying. When he was saying, offer Isaac up, he was saying, I want you to give up your security. I want you to give up your 401K. Because the more sons you had, the more people you had to work the field. And so the more sons you had to work the field, the more money you could generate. And because there was no 401K and because there was no life insurances and because there was no business plan back then, you needed as many kids as possible to work the field to generate income. And so he goes and he's about to drive the knife and the stake into his son. And then he hears an angel cry out that says, leave the boy alone. And then he sees this ram in the caught in the thicket, and they offer the ram on behalf of the, and on behalf of Isaac. And so what we learn from this is that that was actually a picture of Jesus, because Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, who had his own crown of thorns that died in, in the place of other people. So he was pushing him to do it by faith. Verse thirty, one of the most favorite verses in the Bible, it says. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been circled. The children of Israel were walking into the promised land with this person named Joshua. And so they're walking into the promised land. They run up on Jericho. Jericho has these high fortified walls. And so they come up to, Jake, they come up to Joshua and they say, hey, what's the strategy you want to employ? And Joshua had talked to the Lord already. He said, um, we're going to do something called the circle and the shout strategy. Everybody was like, all right, circle and shout. Like, what is, what is that? So he's like, I want everybody to line up, and then I want you to walk around these walls silently. So this was the first on-mute challenge. Y'all, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Beyonce on mute. I know y'all listen to that. Anyway. So they're like, ho, ho, ho. No battering rams? He's like, no. Um, no tactical maneuvers? No, no fighting. So let me get this straight. You just want us to walk around this wall. And then after we walk around this wall a few times, we're going to shout, it's going to fall down. Yes. And that's what they did. The walls fell down. Here's faith. Here's where the faith is at. The faith is trusting in God to do something when it defies conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom would say you might need to stay there a little bit longer. But faith says, no, no, I'm going to trust God and do it because I heard his voice and I trust that he's able to do more with me stepping out of faith than he is there. So faith is him pushing forward. Here's what I want you to know, friends. They did that. And everybody throughout the, the verse, everybody throughout this chapter, we learned did something. Noah built an ark. Abraham left his hometown. Jacob blessed his sons. Joseph instructed his children. Moses chose to leave Egypt. Joshua fought against the Midianites. What am I saying? Faith is an action. It's a verb. It's not a noun. Some of us want to have this ethereal, uh, mental idea of faith. No, no. Faith is always a verb. It's expressed in your choices. So you can't say you have great faith if your faith is not corresponding with your actions. Because you'll know someone's faith by their works. They walk in a parallel line with one another. A few years ago, I tore my ACL. That is awful, isn't it? Anybody ever tore an ACL ligament? And so pain was excruciating, and I was playing basketball, and one of the pastors fell on my leg. And I was like, man, I don't even have good insurance like that, man. Jesus. And so... I went to the doctor, and he confirmed what I thought the problem was. He said, hey, he said, I got good news. I said, well, good. He said, the good news is that you made it here in time before your knee fell apart. I was like, okay. He's like, you tore your ACL, and you tore something called your medial meniscus. And I was like, oh, great. I'm just, I'm just in bad shape right now. But he said, no, no, I think we can take care of it, but we have to go to surgery. So they went through surgery, and we got it fixed. They took a cadaver, and they put it in my leg. Now the knee's stronger than ever. Here, here's faith. Here's, here's what I mean by faith. 
Faith is not me just acknowledging that the ACL was torn. That wouldn't have been faith. Faith is me getting knowing that the ACL is torn, then after that, getting a doctor's appointment, and then getting an MRI, then going to surgery and laying myself vulnerably on a table after taking laughing gas and propofol and having someone I really don't know well, haven't looked at their credentials like that, operating on my knee and believing that after he was done that I was going to have a healthy outcome on the other side. That's what faith is. Faith is action. Here's what I'm saying. You may not be going through surgery right now, but God wants to lay some of you on the gurney and lay some of you on the table because he needs to do surgery. He needs to do surgery on your heart. He needs to do surgery in your spirit. He needs to do surgery in your mind because somewhere along the line, you have forgotten about his ability to heal. You've forgotten about his ability to open up doors. Somewhere along the line, because of the negative situation you're in, you've forgotten about God's ability to do supernatural things. He knows how to take his super and put it on top of your natural and make things that do not work, work, and you don't even understand how. So faith, friends, is an action. Here's the third one. Faith pleases God. Faith pleases God. Have you ever met someone with impossibly high standards? And they're like, not, you're not able to please them? Don't look at your spouse. Don't, don't look. Wink two times if it's your spouse. I'm not joking. Don't do that. Don't do that. What are they? They're kind of critical. They're kind of judgy. When you do something right, they don't give you credit for the thing that you did right. They're kind of stubborn and all that type of stuff. Here's the thing. Some of us think that about God. We think God is critical. We think he's stingy. We have bought into the lie that Eve took in the garden. The snake slithers up to her and says, has God said you shouldn't eat of this tree? He just knows that if you eat of this, you'll become like God's, like him. In other words, he's painting God as stingy. He's planning God as withholding something from them. And some of us in this building right now think that God is withholding something from you. Well, let me just say, if God was willing to offer up his son, Jesus Christ, if he was willing to offer his son, Jesus, on the cross of Calvary for you to pay for a crime that you didn't commit, that, that he didn't commit, but he did so at a volunteer, surely he's not withholding anything from you. Surely he's not holding, withholding anything. And so... We're like, man, I'm trying to do all these things to please God. I'm doing all these ritual acts. I'm coming to church regularly. I've then attended the growth track and went to cruise, and, and I'm working hard, and I show up for set up and tear down, and I'm coming to church regularly, and I ain't been, even been to church in a while. I don't, even, I, I don't remember church even being like this. There's a whole bunch of lights and cameras, and I can't even barely see. I can't even look at my Bible like that, Pastor. The, the lights are so low. Like, we don't even remember church being like this. But here's the thing. None of those things bring favor from God. You know what brings favor from God? It's faith. It's faith. Look what the author says in verse 2. He says, and by this, the ancients, somebody say the ancients, talking about those in Hebrews 11, it says they were commended by God. In other words, when they moved in faith, they were approved by God. What I'm saying, another word for approve is the word favor. It's when God shows you divine kindness to us undeserving human beings. And as I said, the way that God showed us the greatest kindness is by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to experience the shame and experience. Well, well Pastor, why is that even important? Why would I build my life on a dead guy that lived some, some, live some 2,000 years ago? Well, here's the thing. We, on our own accord, cannot please God. On our own accord. It doesn't matter what we do. No matter how much we do, no matter what rules we follow, no matter how many times we attend church, it still does not meet up to God's standard. And so because of that, you and I would have to pay the penalty for not following that standard forever, forever. And it's almost like it accumulates. You know, I got a ticket in Philly the other day. Parking ticket. Julio, parking ticket. It was $36 if I paid it at the top of September. And then it was $100. I paid the middle of, middle of September. So you know how we just paid it the other day. And the thing had just accumulated and accumulated and accumulated over time. It just compounded. And here's the thing. All the things that we've done against God, it has compounded over time. 
It had just gotten worse and worse and worse. Our lives are filled with more baggage. We have more sin. We do things our own way. We become stuck in our ways. But here's the thing. I got an email that said the ticket had been paid for. Here's the thing. God is sending us a ticket to let us know that the crimes of the past, the present, and the future have already been paid for. I've covered the costs. I've covered, the, I've covered your idolatry. I've covered that porn habit. I've covered that anger habit. I've covered that indifference that you have to the spiritual things. I've covered all of those things. And so now I have the favor of God and the blessing of God because I've made Christ the foundation of my life and the Lord of the way I live. That's the primary way. But then you have to have faith and work. So when I believe in God in faith, he gives me favor. I don't know how he does it, but sometimes he just lets you have a boring day. Oh, boring, uneventful days are some of the best days ever. When nobody went to the hospital, I didn't get a negative call. The paycheck hit, even though I worked for it, it still hit. There wasn't no complications. The car turned on. There was food in the refrigerator. Some of the blessings of God are in the regular mundane times that we walk with him. See, we don't need, when you walk with Jesus for a while, you don't need dopamine shots with him all the time. You don't need dopamine. Sometimes you just know that I have God's favor because I'm walking with him in the boring nature of the day, and he's just sustaining me and keeping me from falling what I could have fallen a long time ago. Friends, this is where we're at, friends. It requires action. It requires. So somebody might be saying, well, Pastor, how do I have faith? How do I? What, what does this look like for me practically? Here, here's what I say. Number one, maybe some of you in here, let me give you a, a plethora of options. Maybe some of you in here need to share your faith. Maybe that's your next step of faith, is to share it with your coworkers, to share it with your friends. A lot of times we don't share our faith because we feel like we don't have the answers. And let me tell you, that's happened to me multiple times. I've been flipped by a pan, like a pancake by some of these philosophical arguments out there. I'm like, what? You believe what? What I do is I say, hey, let me... Um, let me grab your number and I'll uh, call you with the answer in a few days. And it normally works out. Some of us need to share our faith with somebody. Some of us need to tell others about Jesus and the belief that we have in him. Some of us need to surrender our lives to Christ. But some of us need to attend a crew. You've been trying to do life by yourself for so long. We preached a whole sermon series about community that I hope was blessing you, but you're still kind of living that isolated life. And maybe you need to do something by faith by joining a group of 5 to 15 people that are going in the same spiritual direction, that are interested in helping you grow and mature and walk with God. Maybe some of you just need to start coming to church regularly. Maybe that's what we need to do. I know you haven't been to church in a while. And listen, I'm happy you're here. You made it. Man, I'm so proud of you. Well, I'm going to encourage you to keep on coming back. Just keep on coming back. Make it a regular rhythm in your life. Because not only will it positively affect your mental health, but you'll see growth in your life that you've never seen before. So I want to encourage you. Maybe, maybe that's it. And, and maybe, let me, let me caveat this by saying, as we always say at Accelerate Church, we're not after your life savings. We're after your life. That's why we don't have any $50, $20, $100 offering lines. That's why we don't even pass the plate. We just keep it in the back. But for some of you, you need to have the faith to start giving to God as you know you should be. Where it challenges your faith because you're like, well, God, if I give this, I may not have, you know, some of the things that I really want. But here's what I know is that God can do more with 90 percent than you can do with 100 percent. And when you give, you're not just giving so we can keep the lights on. You're giving so that we can reach people far from Jesus. You're giving so we can continue to baptize people. You're giving so we can continue to build calming rooms. You're building, you're, you're doing this so that we can create life-giving spaces for our kids to know more about Jesus. That's why you're giving. But on top of that, God promises or he attaches a promise to your giving. He says, if you sow generously, you will reap generously. And maybe that doesn't always mean that you're going to get all the money back and all that stuff. But maybe it does mean that you will reap in peace or you'll reap in joy or you're reaping just having a good relationship with your child and still being their hero. That you, you'll reap it. But he also says that if you give, it will gi be given to you. Press down, shaking together, pouring out on your lap. So maybe in this season, instead of tipping God, 
Maybe it's time to give towards God in faith, believing that he's going to do exceedingly with it. And again, I'm not saying that because we're in the red or we're struggling. We're not. You've been generous. But I know that we could do so much more as a church if all of us would unite our resources and impact this region for God's glory so we can really reach the 6.2 million people in this area we call Accelerate City in the Delaware Valley region. Maybe someone needs to, by faith, go to Growth Track. You've been dating this for a while, been coming to church. We're cute. You know what I'm saying? We got problems. You know what I'm saying? Our edges are laid. You know we're trying. I don't know if that was a good joke or not, but what I'm saying, you've been dating this for a while. So now it's time for you to take your next step. Maybe you've been asking God for that promotion. Or maybe you've been asking for that job or whatever it is. Maybe it's, start, it's time to start working on that book proposal. Or maybe it's time to work on that business plan. Or actually apply for that LLC. Or actually start investing in your retirement accounts. Or actually saving so that you can get a, go on a vacation with your family post-Easter during their spring break. I'm saying there's some things we can do by faith, friends, but it's going to require faith and works. Not just believing that God is going to show up supernaturally. He works and he does a lot of things amazingly when we decide that we're going to move in direction in concert with him. So I want to encourage you as we work through this series, I want to encourage you to come back week after week as we help you develop some unlimited faith.